。但是佛教不是这个，它着重不是在这个地方。好，那上个星期呢，已经给大家简单的介绍了。Last week, I briefly introduced why Shakyamuni Buddha wanted to renounce the world. A lot of people might ask, living in such a good environment as a prince, who will also inherit his father's kingdom, having a good wife, and also receiving great support and love from the people, why would Buddha want to be a monk? Last time, I briefly introduced the four conditions that led Buddha to become a monk. The four conditions Buddha saw were an old man, a sick man, a dead man, and a shramana. Buddha said, only when we overcome the cycle of birth, age, illness, and death will we be able to achieve happiness. No one can overcome death in this world. We are bound to leave this world the moment we are existing here. Buddha has observed this inevitability of life, hence he started to determine how we overcome this endless cycle. That's why he became a monk. Only then would he be able to give us this brief summary on why people have to do that. This is just a brief introduction. Now let's have a brief introduction of Buddha's lineage. The founder of Buddhism was Shakyamuni Buddha about 2,500 years ago. Buddha, along with his five bhikkhus, formed the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, also known as the Triple Gems. The condition that led to the foundation of the Triple Gems is from here. It has been approximately 3,000 years since Buddha taught the five monks and they all attained arhathood. I'm not going to talk too much about the examples. Why? Because we only have a one-hour session per week. It's such a short time. It's not enough time to go too deep into this. And because the last time we met face to face, we also talked about this. So I'm not going to repeat myself in this respect. I will leave this time for other content. So to actually understand Buddhism itself, we can all see that April 8th, 624 BC lunar calendar is the birthday of Buddha. We usually celebrate the birthday of Buddha by bathing the baby prince Siddhartha. It represents purifying our tainted heart, washing away the taint, so that our heart returns to its purity. So every year we always celebrate this event, which is called Vesak Day. We also celebrate the day Prince Siddhartha became Buddha and the day Buddha went into Nirvana. Those are the common celebrations that are held by all Buddhist communities. Why do we persist in celebrating them? It is so we do not forget our original teacher, our founding teacher. If there is no Shakyamuni Buddha, there is no Buddhism in this world. Also, Buddhism is quite different from other religions. I will slowly and gradually explain that to you. The point is to understand, to experience, and to remember his compassion, of his caring for all beings, of his existence that shines the path for us to become enlightened and liberated from suffering so that we can live a fulfilling, happy life. That's why we celebrate our teacher. We all know about his birthplace in the northern India subcontinent, in present-day Nepal. It's in the south of the Himalaya mountains. In that country, there was a kingdom called Kapilavastu. This is the kingdom where he was born in and this is in present-day Nepal. 
His father, who is also the king of this kingdom, is called Sudodana. The mother of the Buddha is called Maya. She was the queen, so we call her Maya Devi. Unfortunately, Queen Maya, after giving birth to the Buddha, passed away seven days after the birth. After her passing, she was born into the Trias Trimsa heaven, which is the heaven where the heavenly beings we talked about last week are, the third level of heaven from us. One day in that Trias Trimsa heaven equals 100 years in our world. Think about that in this perspective. It's been 3,000 years according to the Chinese calendar since Buddha was born. If one day in that heaven equals our 100 years, she only experienced like a month in this heaven throughout this 3,000 years of human history. She actually had a vow before that I just want to introduce briefly. We know now Queen Maya was the mother of the Buddha. Her vow actually was to become the mother of all Buddhas. So how does that work? It means she wants to be the person who bears Buddhas from all directions into this world. Before any Buddha comes to this world to give sermons, to turn the Dharma wheel, she will always be there waiting to give birth to the Buddha and then she will always leave soon after the Buddha is born. This is just some insight for you guys. So Queen Maya was not a normal person. That's why we call her Great Maya. I just want to give you the concept that she was a Bodhisattva, actually, not a human. Everything she did was designed for us to learn and benefit from. When Buddha's mother left this world, she had a sister who also married King Sudodana and became the stepmother of Prince Siddhartha. So when Prince Siddhartha reached the age of 16, he married the beautiful Yasodhara. So he was very, very young when he got married, 16 years of age. Now, that is too young. One should be at least 30 years of age. After they married, they had a child called Rahula. This is a very brief introduction to Buddha's lineage. We now know who Shakyamuni Buddha is, his history, where he was born, who took care of him, who his father and mother were, and where his kingdom was. Also, I would like to explain to everyone, after Buddha attained enlightenment, all his family became monks and nuns. Think about it. His stepmother became the first bhikshuni, the first nun in Buddhism. His son became a monk at nine years old. All of his cousins and siblings, about six or seven of them, also became monks. Although the only person in the direct branch of his family that did not become a monk was the king, Sudodana, he did chant Amitabha Buddha's name to go to the Pure Land at the end of his life. So you can see from Buddha himself, he not only helped other beings, he also helped his own family to attain arhathood. That means they are no longer affected by life and death. Think about us in our current era. Who wants to become a monk? No one wants to be a monk in current times. You don't believe it? Ask Alex, ask Michael, ask Dylan. Do you want to be a monk? Impossible. Why is that? It's not easy. Therefore, to become a monk in Buddhism is a big duty, a big calling. A true ordained monk who has taken the vow always gives himself to the society. 
so they can serve everyone in society. No matter how hard, they will continue to serve everyone. Becoming a monk is not about enjoying respect. It's not a career. It's a mission to give your life, all of your life, to all the beings, just like the Buddha did, to serve all living beings. Even though we are not monks, we should also have that kind of heart. How do I become a good example to society? How do I give a good impression of Buddhism to society, to let Buddhism have a good, positive, empowering reputation? The first thing is, if you want to achieve this goal, is to cultivate ourselves. I am a Buddhist. I am truly cultivating Buddhism. If I am, I have to be a good example. I have to set the right example. Only then can other people have confidence when they hear that learning Buddhism is a good idea. If we are just doing self-cultivation, just cultivating like chanting Amitofo, which is good, but then when we encounter situations and we become angry or lose our temper, become greedy and all of that, people would think this is not very good. If we can be respectful to our elders, love and respect our friends and people around us, to give them a feeling of warmth when they are around you, only then will they be attracted to Buddhism. They will say, oh, learning Buddhism makes you such a good person. I want to learn Buddhism. Therefore, Buddha himself also led all of his family to become monks, not just monks, arhats. Now we will talk about what Buddhism is. Some people say Buddhism is a religion. Some people say Buddhism is a culture. Some people say Buddhism is a high-level science. Some people say Buddhism is about politics. Some people ask me, how big is the area of command, the kingdom of Buddha? I just respond, Buddha is not a government official. Why would you think of him in that way? So this is a misunderstanding. Some people ask me this question as well. How big is his area of control in Sydney? How many people follow him? They use that kind of mindset to think about Buddha. Some people say Buddhism is a philosophy, also that it is recognized by the world as the most comprehensive and sophisticated system of philosophy. The sutras recorded from Buddha's sermons are the pinnacle of the world's philosophy, the peak, that nothing can top them. Its logic and its sophistication in how it is constructed is beautiful. For example, there are many educated people or people that have a passion for learning. Are you one of those people? If you are eager to learn, you would ask these kinds of questions. How did Amitabha Buddha build his pure land? Why do the Buddhas of the Ten Directions only praise Amitabha Buddha? Why do they only praise the pure land? Regardless of race or religious belief, those who are educated or have a passion for learning must be eager to unravel the mysteries of the universe. They want to know where do we come from? Where did the world come from? Where did the universe come from? What is the origin story? Why does the earth have human beings? Why do we have a distinction between humans, animals, and plants? We all have that inquisitive, want-to-know instinct. Before I learned Buddhism, I always asked my mom, Mom, you said I was created by God, but I was born by you, so how does that work? Before I was a monk, I kept asking this question. No one can answer it for me. 
no one. Since we are created by God, who created God himself? How did our solar system come into being? Why do humans have life and death? Why doesn't God, if he can do that, create a perfect world where there is no life and death? If he has all the power that is described in the doctrines, why didn't that happen? Why do we have so much suffering? No one can answer these questions for me. These kinds of questions were always in my heart and mind back then. When people die, where do they go? When people come to this world, why are there so many differences? Some people are good looking, some not so good looking. Some people are born into wealth, high positions and power, while other people are born into poverty. No one can answer these for me. Why do I want to chant Amitofo? Why do I want to go to the Pure Land? If no one can answer these questions, then it is not worth learning. This also tells us that we need to start critically thinking about how we resolve these fundamental questions. For most people, we might also think about having a good, happy life in our current existence. That also requires an inquisitive mind as well. Like how do I build a happy family? What are the components required to build a happy family? How do I find a good spouse? How do I provide for my family? How do we live together peacefully? Shakyamuni Buddha throughout his entire teaching life taught about this. Where do humans come from? After humans die, where do they go? Why are human and natural environments like this? If you look at the sutras, they will slowly introduce these points to you. Ideas about the finer points of Buddhism. Today, if someone asks us, as a lay or monastic member of Buddhism, what is Buddhism about? How would you answer it? Buddhism has such a vast collection of sutras. There are 84,000 methods of cultivation. Which religion has such a big volume, more than a library actually, if you put it there, such a big volume of sutras? Most religions have only one Bible or a few Gitas. We have a library worth of collection. So what is the goal of Buddhist teachings? What are they trying to achieve by giving us these teachings? How do we answer these questions? We also need to be able to answer well. Otherwise, a lot of people will misunderstand Buddhism. They would think it is just a superstitious old religion that we come to the Buddha chanting hall and pray to the God called Buddha so that he gives us his blessings. Or we will sit down and chant Amitofo in the chanting hall all the time. If you don't understand why we do that, a lot of people would think, is that all that Buddhism is about? So we must understand why we are doing this. So what is Buddhism? Let's continue. We just need to break it down one by one to the finest points so that we can really understand it in our heart. How is it helping our society? How is it helping myself? How is it helping people around us, our world? First, what Buddhism is not. Buddhism is not a religion, so we do pray to Buddha, which looks like we are worshipping, but we are not worshipping a god, actually. We're just giving our respect, the highest form of respect. It's not a philosophy or a field of science. It is a well-rounded and all-encompassing education. 
it takes everything good about education and more and puts it in there. Why? Because it gives us wisdom, wisdom to discern right from wrong. It also gives you ways to attain longevity, health, infinite fortune, and infinite merits. They are all there. What your future will look like, what is the outlook of your life. Buddhism is a light that shines that path for you, so you are not carelessly walking down a path that will cause you more suffering. Although there might be difficulties and obstacles at any time, it will help you in the face of those obstacles or troubles. You will be able to build up the right system to overcome them. For example, marriage. A lot of people, especially in the 70s and on, but also in these modern times, a lot of people are taking this like a joke. After a few days or months, they get divorced. You know they just do it for the fun of it. Or sometimes when people harm us by saying something hurtful or defaming, how do we resolve that properly? What are the ways to resolve these properly? Buddhism, on a larger scale, can harmonize our society so that people can live in peace and also purify our hearts. It dispels the ignorance that creates more suffering for us. How do we stop creating miseries for ourselves or stop others from creating miseries? Education. Education enlightens everyone. No one can live without this education if you want to live a happy life. Say in Australia, it's a form of fortune. You are able to be born in Australia or to migrate to Australia and live this happy life or stable life. This is a fortune. But how do you use this fortune? How do we earn respect and learn from society? We also need to be educated on its composite effect. Look at someone with a beautiful, happy family, and we want a very good relationship with our spouse, parents, in-laws, children, and siblings. That all requires education for everyone to work together. That's why all competency is well-rounded. Therefore, Buddhism is an education. So what we know is that Buddhism is not a religion, a philosophy, or a science, but an education. So how did we get started? Why does Buddha put so much emphasis on teaching? For 49 years that Buddha appeared in our world, everything about him was about education. An example. We learn by example, right? He is an example for us to learn from. Everything he says, even the way he moves, sleeps, and sits, they are all a way to educate us. Let's continue to learn what Buddhism teaches us. So from where we start to understand that Buddhism is actually an education, how do we find out what Buddhism teaches us? Because people might ask, since you keep saying Buddhism is an education, where can you see it? Where can you find it in our conduct in Buddhist society? First is the way we address each other and address the Buddha in Buddhism. We address Shakyamuni Buddha as our founding teacher, our original teacher. Earlier we did that by saying Namo Ben Shi Shi Jiao Nifo. This is why she in Chinese translated into English is teacher. Ben in this case means root, our root teacher. So putting it in clear English 
He's our original first teacher. So this teacher of ours has gone through many lives of sacrifice and has gone through a lot of trouble just to find the way for us to gain enlightenment. Shakyamuni Buddha is a teacher who founded this teaching for us. In front of Buddha, we address ourselves as students. In Chinese, we call ourselves Dizze, which means student. Dizze Dylan, Dizze Alex, Dizze Michael is the proper way of addressing ourselves. So our relationship with Buddha is one of a teacher and a student. Buddha is our teacher. We are his students. Like when we were young and went to school, who taught us? A teacher. Without a teacher teaching us, why do we go to school? That's the whole point of school. If a student wants to be successful, to be great, they have to listen closely to what the teacher is teaching them. Shakyamuni Buddha is the same. Now we are his students. Shakyamuni Buddha is our founding teacher. So this relationship is quite unique to Buddhism in comparison to religions. In religions, they don't talk about students and teachers because they center around the relationship of the father and the son, which frames the relationship between God and humans. Thus, religions are like that. You are my son. Because I created you, this world is created by me. So such a relationship happens. You have to listen to me because I am your creator. Buddhism is not like that. Buddhism educates without prejudice as long as you are willing to learn. Buddha will not refuse. If you don't want to learn, Buddha will not punish you. He will just walk away. I don't want to learn Buddhism. I want to believe and learn about other religions. Would Buddha say, no, you cannot leave. You will be punished to hell. No, he wouldn't say that. Is there any sutra where Buddha says, you are a betrayer, you are the Judas, you will be punished? No, Buddha always accords to conditions. If you are willing to learn, he will be there, he will help. If you don't want to learn, the door is there. You are free to leave. Because Buddha educates without prejudice to status, caste, race, religion, or gender, Buddha does not separate us like that. He does not have that concept. He will not punish you. He will not put you in hell or condemn you. He wouldn't say, you are my creation. It does not happen like that. So Buddhism is something quite unique. Since we understand and affirm Buddhism is in the category of education, let's talk about education itself. What are the parts of Buddhism that we keep practicing that shows that it is an education? The first thing is that the title Namo, founding teacher, Shakyamuni Buddha represents education. I will break it down word by word to show you why Buddha puts such a heavy emphasis on education. First, Namo. Namo founding teacher Shakyamuni Buddha. Namo Amitabha Buddha. Namo Kusidigarbha Bodhisattva. Namo Avalakiteshvara Bodhisattva. What does Namo mean? It's a Sanskrit word. In Chinese or English, it means to return, to go home, to reform our faults, to reflect on our past wrongdoings, 
and then return to our true nature, which is good and pure. Why do we have to return? It is because we have all committed a lot of faults, a lot of habits that are not wholesome. If these habits are allowed to accumulate untouched and unmanaged, they will become karma, which will cause a lot of trouble in our future. Buddha does not fear that his students make mistakes. He fears that his students will make mistakes and not correct them, leaving the mistake to fester. The right attitude is, I must correct my faults whenever I discover them. A lot of people like myself have a temper. We might easily lose our temper, and if we allow this bad temper to continue, it will cause a lot of our loved ones around us to suffer when they are with us. They will gradually leave us one by one. Also, gossiping is another bad habit, a common habit. A lot of people gossip because they like to pick on people's faults, people's wrongdoings, people's mistakes, causing disharmony among groups. Another example are swear words or harsh words. These are a few examples of what not to do when we interact with society in our everyday capacity. The core of it is, have I done something that caused harm and pain towards others or discomfort to others? So the name of the Buddha himself reminds us of this. When we read Namo, you must think, I must return back, return from my faults. I must correct myself. Only then can my life be as bright as Buddha's. That's what Namo founding teacher Shakyamuni Buddha means. From now on, I must think, I will truly love the people around me. If I love them, I should not cause harm to them or cause them heartbreak. I should not cause my parents to fear for me because of my behavior or worry about me. So what does Shakya mean? It is also Sanskrit. In English, it's called compassionate, a loving heart, a caring heart toward others. It teaches us to treat everyone, all beings, with compassion, with love, trying to remove them from their current suffering and give them happiness. Especially in this era, a lot of people lack one thing, a compassionate heart, a heart of being considerate. Because of this insufficiency of being inconsiderate, we have this kind of society nowadays. Everyone's guessing, second guessing, third guessing each other, stepping up to hating each other, hating the world, hating school, and things like that. If you are like Bodhisattva Guanyin, if we adapt an attitude like Bodhisattva Guanyin, are we even going to be angry towards people? pick on people's faults. Even though we might not be 100% like Bodhisattva Guan Yin, if we can learn 10% of the way he looks at the world, like Guan Yin is always looking at the good side of people, the best side of people. I might not even be able to help them in their current circumstance, but I can have a good mind, positive meta, a positive mindset to them with a prayer towards them so that they may be well, they may be good, they may be kind, they may be healthy, their family may be in peace. We might not be able to help them now, but we always must have that heart all of the time. So this is how we plant compassionate seeds in our heart. The Buddha's name itself is the same. Why do we keep chanting his name? 
It is not for the sake of chanting, it's for the sake of completing this virtue, reminding us to be compassionate all of the time. A person who is 100% compassionate. Have you ever seen Bodhisattva Guan Yin become angry, show his temper? Have you ever seen Buddha show his temper in the records? There is a story about Buddha. There was a person who did not follow Buddha. He went in front of Buddha and without greeting him, began swearing at Buddha, swearing and swearing, using all kinds of harsh words. Buddha was not moved, just sitting there. He scolded, he scolded and scolded until he was tired, and then he asked Buddha, I keep scolding you. I keep swearing at you. Why aren't you responding? Buddha replied, I don't feel anything. As he replied with a smile, a joyful smile, a cheerful smile. But if you were in Buddha's position, how would you feel? How would you react? If someone swears at you or scolds you, picks on you, with that kind of force, you would immediately jump up and get angry. You would start to think, who are you? You are not my mom. You are not my dad. Why do you scold me? Somebody may even point a knife in retaliation. There are humans like that. There was a time when I was sitting in a plane, I witnessed a small incident. A small thing, like a flight attendant being a little neglectful in their services. Or when one of the passengers stood up and just began swearing and swearing and swearing. If we learn the teachings of Buddha, would we react like that? Some people, unfortunate people, were raised in that kind of environment. All they know about is complaining and complaining and complaining. When they're young, they're exposed to complaining. And then when they grow up, they become that kind of person, swearing and complaining. Buddha is not like that. On the other hand, Buddha always has a heart of tranquility, joy, and bliss. In the normal depiction of Buddha, you will never see Buddha with an angry face. No, you will not. So Shakya means compassionate. Muni means purity. So purity in what? When we face everything, all kinds of people or things or matters or business, our mind must be clear, must be very clear. What is right, what is wrong, what I must do and what I must not do. If you can do that, all these societal problems, divorces, all the crime would not occur, especially marriage. Why do marriages not last? They cannot hold on to what they have to be content. A lot of them lost the purity, lost the muni, and got dragged along by the temptation of the outside world. Some people are supposed to have a happy life, supposed to have a very good life, but because of one error and their mind was muddled because of the temptations, they gave it all up. The name of Buddha alone teaches this. What about the second point? This is from the name of Buddha. From today, after this lesson, when we chant the name of Buddha, what does the name of Buddha tell me? Number one, I must return. That means namo. I must return from the faults, from the unwholesome deeds, the wrong deeds, to prevent doing bad deeds and go back to my true nature. So many sutras given by Buddha. What's the core of the sutras? What's the key point of the sutras? 
to reform our faults, to return to our good self, our true nature. We must investigate this. We'll continue next week. It's been an hour already. This is how I got interested in Buddhism. In the past, I was not interested in religion. I learned Hinduism, Taoism, Catholicism, and Christianity. But why did I end up choosing Buddhism? Because all the answers are in there. All my questions were answered. It's just that we don't know about it. Buddha has already left us all the answers, one by one, in one book by one book for us. We just don't know it. Isn't that a waste? Buddhism gives us a perspective of what we should do, what we should not do to have a happy life. Therefore, I think it's very important for me to introduce it to you. It's very interesting. I'll pick some main points because there are too many sutras, really a lot. So I will pick some main points for you, interesting points. So today, that's it. Next week, next Wednesday, same time, 8.30, okay? See you next week. Thank you, teacher. Master says, Buddha bless you. Amitofo. Okay, bye. <laughs> Dedication. May the merits and virtues accrued from this work adorn the Buddha's pure land, repay the four kindnesses above, and relieve the sufferings of those in the three paths below. May those who see or hear of this bring forth the heart of understanding and compassion and at the end of this life, be born together in the land of ultimate bliss.